This is the unrestricted free agent. The Jimbo Fisher stuff. Were you in the room the other day when he threw us? Part of the reason we had so much fun being Clemson was because we used to talk a lot of shit to him and they couldn't handle it. You feel fine, but your hands are shaking. Coach Berger could give a damn. I want to take these athletes and mentor them. Why can't the Gamecocks win at the SEC tournament? So sunny all the time, so hot. (laughs) (laughs) Too too sunny. (laughs) Too sunny. Fans are going to be fans, and people who understand the sport are are going to talk sports. With some weird dynamics, it's going to be painful, but I think at the end of the day, we'll be stronger people for it. On a Tuesday morning, welcome in Tim Hill, Unrestricted Free Agent. Hope your Tuesday's off to a good start. Let's all have a celebratory sip of coffee, although I'm not sure what we're celebrating. How about we celebrate life as we get going at 8 a.m. this morning, huh? Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. D.C., we see you. Morning to you, sir. Craig, as well. He says morning to all the folks out there. Chris. With a morning fellow Gamecocks only. Take that, Troy, if you're listening already. A resident Clemson fan. And Kirby, only directing his morning salutations to me with a smiley face emoji. Thanks for weighing in, guys. Getting the live chat going already. That puts me in a great mood. I think all of us on this show specifically and in general in the Southeast area are in much better moods here in the last several days because the countdown continues. We're getting close to single digits, right? What are we, 11 today? I told you guys I'm not a big countdown day. I feel like you can't be a a massive, hey, appreciate today and carpe diem and all that if you're, you're counting down stuff all the time or you're looking ahead or behind or whatever it is. But with that being said, college football season is just a little bit different. I think we all understand that. I mean, if you want to just go college football season, you got the, was it Nebraska Northwestern game this weekend? And then you got a Thursday backyard brawl next week, Pittsburgh and West Virginia. I love it. (laughs) Chris, I guess we can say good morning to our resident Tater. He says, LOL. That's very kind. This is almost harder than when it's 100 days away. You can taste it, Craig says. There is that element for sure. I hope this show can be a two-hour gift, a two-hour distraction that gets you two hours closer to kickoff. That's the plan today. And let's start with some football news, shall we? Cam Smith, Carolina. What is he? You can't even say junior or senior really these days anymore. It means next to nothing with the extra COVID year. You, you can transfer all over the place if you submit a waiver you're likely to get it there for the second straight year in college football there is an eighth year senior out there i forget which smaller school he's at so ridiculous so i I was gonna do the usual and uh junior for westwood high school cab smith who knows what year he is it doesn't even exist anymore in 2022 but cam smith the ultra talented corner let's say from carolina preseason second team all-american from the associated press out there we we talk next to nothing about this guy it's crazy we we say next to nothing i i i think in large part because there is position first of all okay well what what would you put below cornerback as far as positions of strength but silence Punter, actually, punter, you probably recognize more because he's one guy and he his his play is significant. So not even punter or kicker, right? Corner is below punter or kicker when it comes to a position of strength but silence. I think only offensive linemen. I think that's it. I don't think you can have another position on the there is no other position on the football field convince me otherwise if you think so oh i'm coming in with strong opinions this morning watch out for me doing my best national host impersonation you got it you better come strong today guys 
<laughs> so ridiculous caricatures. So even as I'm hearing myself, I'm laughing. But it's true. I really believe this. I'm, I'm not just making this up for entertainment value. As I'm thinking about it, position of strength but silence. There is no other one on the football field other than offensive lineman. Corner is next. If Cam Smith has a quiet 2022, he's going to have a really good 2022. And that makes no sense, right? That is counterintuitive. In sports, usually, unless what? what? What's another position out there? If you're quiet, you're really, really good. Uh, umpire or referee, that's the one that pops in my head. Uh, broadcaster is another one. If we're talking about the sports business, right? If no one's really talking about you, especially play-by-play, that means you're probably just really, really good. Umpire, especially behind the plate, on the bases, uh, referees. Yeah. For sure. But as far as maybe like a goalie, but no, I mean, especially hot. I'm thinking hockey. You can, you got a chance to make a bunch of saves and the whole thing. Yeah. I, I, I can't think of one, but corner is it. I always think back to Dante Robinson as my number one example from a Carolina standpoint where I covered the team every single day. He was a great representative this is back in this is Lou Holtz days right this is old school I think this is the 04 season maybe 05 and he ends up being a first round draft pick and as a TV guy back in the day I I don't have any highlights to show you they they never threw him the ball they just didn't and that's what you got to have from Cam Smith coming up in 2022 now, J.C. Horn is a, a another pretty good example there, right? Really, really well thought of. He's a little bit different when your dad plays in the NFL and not just plays in the NFL, but becomes a lightning rod for his personality that goes along with his play in the NFL. You're not going to sneak under the radar. But from the Carolina standpoint, I feel like there was a division amongst Gamecock fans. Oh, that's a good one, Craig. Long snapper. Nice work. Holder, how about Holder? Got to get there too, right? But still, sometimes Holders get lots of credits. Long snapper is a good one. But for the amount of snaps you're on the field, corner still way above long snapper as far as positions of strength but silence. You got to be Cam, Cam Smith and DBs like him are so good typically that we don't even recognize it as a fan watching the ball because the ball doesn't go their way. DC, I want to apologize earlier today. I'm feeling salty. You mean already today and just ahead of time? I like it. Yep, Craig mentioned JC Horn. Good job. John, good to see John Fru in. Mentioning Jackie Bradley Jr. does his talking with his glove. Yeah, that that's one of the opposites, right? Center field. You can't be a quiet center fielder with your play. I'm talking about with the play, right? You got to be so good as a corner that they don't throw at you. You take away that side of the field. That that was Dante Robinson back in the day. Jonathan Joseph after him, before those guys. Sheldon Brown, Andre Goodman. I mean, there's a bunch of different examples from South Carolina. We We could go through the years, right? But to have a second team preseason AP All America, a, a great start for a Carolina team that is in a in a great place right now. They're in a great place because I think most of the fan base is realistic. You talk about getting your expectations reset will Muschamp has done that steve spurrier put things in a, on a different stratosphere and then it ended and then will Muschamp very much brought everybody back to reality i think from the gamecock standpoint and now to have as much success as carolina did under year one in shane beamer in the shane beamer era and then still to be picked fifth 
in the SEC East this year with a transfer quarterback like Spencer Rattler coming in with some other significant additions out there. Not too many subtractions. I get it. Nick Muse, J.J. Enigbare, off to the NFL. But, I mean, what is it? Three guys drafted. Kevin Harris being the other one. Zaquandre White scored a touchdown the other day. Did you guys see that? One catch and one carry, I think, for the Miami Dolphins trying to make that team in the preseason. Going to be difficult. But no tremendously... uh, no tremendous major losses out there. Jason Brown transfers over to Virginia Tech as the quarterback. Zeb Nolan is now officially a, a GA again. But this just adds to the preseason accolades that Cam Smith has gotten. If this is just one list out there or one deal, then it, it would be easy to dismiss. But a massively important position corner in the SEC and a really good player. and. The preseason hype continues for Cam Smith in a quiet, quiet kind of way, which is certainly from what we've seen in the Welcome Home documentary series through two episodes seems to be not his nature. I think, forget who was talking the other day, named him the best trash talker on the team. Confident. You got to have confidence. You got to have a short memory. And Cam Smith's got to have a good season for the Gamecocks. To me, that good season most likely will translate into a quiet season. But we'll see. Because the more and more you talk about Carolina leading pass defense in the SEC last year, the more and more you hear, oh, that's not anything to brag about. That just means the other teams were able to run on you. And that's for sure. So how much more will Cam Smith and that secondary get tested this year because of the strength of an improved defense. They're talking it up. Interior defensive line. Shane Beamer has been pleased. We'll see. Speaking of the defensive secondary, Marcellus Dial, Darius Rush. Craig says, I think Dial and Rush are going to start at corner and Cam at nickel. Yeah, to me, it, all right, break down the X's and O's all you want to, right? You got five guys back there. You got five starters. Throw in RJ Roderick and the transfer to Vonnie Reed. Those are going to be your guys. I don't care what you call them. Don't care what kind of scheme you're running, Will Muschamp and Travaris Robinson, defensive geniuses. If you overcomplicate things and guys don't know what the heck they're doing, we've seen you look like a clown show back there. Even with some good players. J.C. Horn, Israel Mukwamu, good players. Jamie Robinson, pretty good player. He's on the field at Florida State. And yet, clown show consistently. You got Matt Corral just clowning you publicly after a game saying we knew what they were going to do. So, Clayton White deserves a bunch of credit for what he did last year. Numbers-wise, turnover-wise, as the defensive coordinator at Carolina. I mentioned it yesterday. Now, you're in year two of the chess match. It gets that much more difficult from a coordinator standpoint, I think, after having a foundation for offensive coordinators to go off of uh, a specific matchup. How Cam Smith, Marcellus Dial, Darius Rush play on the outside, huge for Carolina. Because we we do whitewash it a little bit. I think we, I mean, that's what a guy like Jadavian Clowney will do, Melvin Ingram specifically going back to the heyday of Carolina football defensive line strength, I think is where we all automatically go. And it rightfully so with those dudes, but on the outside was really, really good too. You got to have both. John says, sounds like a soap dial and rush. Well, the dial is a soap, I believe. Yeah. Improved throughout the season last year. DC says about Marcellus dial. This is to me, where you want your secondary to be. Ideally, you would have maybe a few more guys behind that starting five. And Shane Beamer talked about that after preseason scrimmage number one about 10 days ago, right? We got our five. Now it's a matter of figuring out who we who else they have. And you, no college football team 
would feel comfortable with just five guys going into the season from a defensive secondary standpoint. An SEC team, a, a lot less comfortable with the physicality of this league. Josh says, I'll miss Zeb's tweets, my happy spot after some of those crushing losses and leading up to the games. I think you're talking about Colonel Zebulia. I, I believe that Twitter account's still active. I don't I don't think you'll I don't think you'll be missing it. I think those tweet, tweets are still gonna pop out, man. Roger in this morning. Jason, Anthony as well. You guys tell me, are you just waking up naturally more happy? Happier, some would say, more energetic, more optimistic. That's what it is right now, in my opinion. <laughs> Craig's just hungry if I say five guys. I, my brain didn't even go there. Well done, sir. To me, it's just that much more fun this time of year. And again, this is the best example I can give you of how good a job Shane Beamer has done to this point. To get Gamecock football, the feel, the atmosphere around Gamecock football back to this point where it has not been in so, so long. And Anthony says, I'm always a chipper guy. Anthony can't always be a chipper guy. We got to deal with some of those other types of feelings, man. But I appreciate the positivity for sure. Oh, no. Now you got to call out guys, DC. Speaking of Clown Show, who was the corner that played under Muschamp that rode the tight end from Texas A&M for about 30 yards? He looked like that guy's backpack. He was the transfer in. Had a really good first season, by the way. And then it was a King, Javaris King, uh, some, something to that effect. I think it was. I think that's who it was. But why, why you got to call a guy out like that? Attaboy, Roger's just waking up. No wonder you had to put on another pot of coffee yesterday. Swig of coffee for you, sir. Yeah, I thought it was King. Jamarcus King, I think, right? I, I, not Chuck Norris, I don't think, Josh. Teddy D, I've never been so excited for a Georgia State-type game. The Dunn household is hyped up for football season, even bought a new flag for the front porch. Good to hear, Teddy D. And... I would challenge you to go back through your years, especially knowing that you went to South Carolina, your wife went there as well. I'm guessing you've probably said this many, many Augusts, and I'm sure I have too. But that's the brilliance. To me, that's, that is the appreciation I think Gamecock fans need to have for Shane Beamer right now, and we need to revel in as college football fans in general. If your program is at a place where you can be waking up in a good mood right now in August. You're in great shape, man. Great shape. Not all, not all programs are there. South Carolina fans probably know that better than anybody, right? It is not a given. It was a given for many, many years, and then it wasn't real quick to be excited, optimistic, enthusiastic about the upcoming college football season and what might happen actually on the field, not just tailgating. On the move, as always, let's get our first guest in, shall we? Our buddy, Scotty Eisberg. Uh, I'm guessing maybe just dropped one daughter off. How, how, how's the school routine and, going? You in go, it? Uh, yeah, yeah, school routine is good. I'm uh, done with one, and now off to the other. Get the other one. So it's... Uh, it's a, a typical iceberg morning with maybe a stop at uh, Costco because I'm pretty low on gas. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a typical iceberg domesticated morning. I had a boy, Scotty, the ABC affiliate sports director down in Charleston. Last time you joined us on your neighborhood walk, I believe. You're going to be able to get out and get some exercise this morning? Uh, sometimes it happens when you're on the move like this, too. We got the the in and out signal. I got to check Scotty's cell phone plan and see what we got going or see exactly where in the low country it pings really well. And then sometimes it does not. We'll see. We can get Scotty moving again as we go through the morning. I see him kind of kind of popping in there, kind of popping out. Let's see how it's going. What do you think, Scotty? I lost you for a second there. What did you? You say, Tim? We're making fun of your, your terrible cell signal 
and how Charleston just doesn't have any cell towers down there because you guys are too busy at the beach and uh, hanging out in the in the battery. Does that sound right? Yeah, we'll see if we can get him going a little bit later. I wanted to get Scotty's take, and we will get Scotty's take if we can get a decent signal here. On the other main news from South Carolina yesterday, Monty Lee popping on a press conference Zoom call. I guess Mark Kingston, the head coach there, recently testing positive for COVID. And Monty Lee has recently returned from Clemson as a head coach at Clemson. Didn't work out. Former Carolina assistant Ray Tanner basically has said that this guy it was was my protege. He's my guy in a lot of ways. I think it was six years that Monty coached with Ray Tanner, something like that. And in some really good years leading up to, it was uh, some College World Series visits, I believe, in 03 and 04. And then Justin Smoke, Reese Havens type years before he got the head coaching job at the College of Charleston, did an excellent job there, parlayed that to the Clemson head coaching job, and then it didn't work out. Not enough postseason success for Monty Lee at Clemson, and now he's back at Carolina in, whew, what a unique situation. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to get Scotty's take on this, right? Uh, Monty Lee is South Carolina through and through. Originally from Spartanburg, did most of his childhood in Lugoff. Spartanburg Methodists, assistant coach, I think, is where Ray Tanner first met him. Played at the College of Charleston. Um, uh, he's a South Carolina guy through and through. Mark Kingston is not. And now he's in this position in his career where he's got to win, and he needs to do it in a, in a pretty big way. And now you you get Monty Lee coming in to help take over the offense, really. Hitters, outfielders, recruiting at the top of his list. But uh, yesterday had some interesting comments. Let's see if that cell signal is any better for our buddy Scotty down in the low country, and it's not. We're going to have to check his, his route for dropping kids off, see where we can uh, ping strongly. So what do you guys make? of the Monty Lee situation. He was asked yesterday by the Charleston Post and Courier's Gene Sapikoff if he'd ever talked to Brad Scott about that situation, about having coached at Carolina, because Brad Scott's been at Clemson now for forever, and Monty Lee said, yeah, he actually um, knows Brad Scott a little bit. They spent some time together, but never really talked about that, which makes sense, right? It'd be the weirdest thing ever. So how was it going from one to the other? <laughs> That's just not how people talk. The question needed to be asked, but didn't didn't surprise me. All right, Kansas in strong this morning. Hope as well. It, it seems to me, I, I feel like I'm picking up on more energy from you guys this type, time of year. Hope says, so glad to see Monty back. I think being back in the assistant role is the best position for him. Like, this is the fascinating part, right? This is almost the Chad Holbrook conversation, which it's fascinating that Holbrook is the head coach of Monty's alma mater down there, the College of Charleston, too. But that was the that was the narrative, right? Chad Holbrook, just not a head coach. Great assistant, but clearly couldn't keep Carolina near nationally competitive like the program was when he took over. Monty Lee, I've never heard that but I don't think you can say that because his first head coaching job went so well. He had the College of Charleston and a super regional man. And then DC, is that what you want to do really? Now you want to get rid of your head coach and Mark Kingston and let the fired Clemson coach now take over? Craig says Monty and Kerry Rich, two of the best hires in a while. Clearly on the basketball side of things with the G.G. Jackson situation working out how it has, it, it's undeniable that Gary Rich, a tremendous hire for a guy in Lamont, Paris, coming in from the outside, not being a South Carolina guy. Now, had Monty Lee been with Mark Kingston from the beginning, that would be a, this would be a, almost an apples-to-apples apples comparison. But this is this is odd. 
Hope it sure wasn't head coach. He's talking about recruiting coordinator also, which Kingston, I think, knows he has to get more of his homegrown talent. Yeah, but in the situation Carolina's in right now, I, I don't think that's a recruiting coordinator type make or break situation. The make or break situation is Carolina's got to win a bunch of games and got to host a regional have that type of season for Gamecock fans, for Ray Tanner to feel good about the Carolina program. That's just what it is. We talked to Stuart Lake about it. He's been there. He said that was fair. And that's just a top 16 type year, right? One of the best teams in the country. One of the top 16. Certainly, South Carolina baseball feels like it deserves, it is one of the top 16 college baseball programs out there was proven for years and years and years that it was proven on the field. Hasn't proven that lately. Got to change. Otherwise, there will be a change. That's why this thing, to call it a no-brainer yesterday, that's what Monty called it, right? A no-brainer coming back to Carolina. That was surprising to me. Scott actually asked Monty, I, I think it was Scott who asked him specifically, if he had planned on taking a year off or had thought about taking a year off. And uh, Monty said, absolutely not. That was not the the line of thinking. His line of thinking was if he wasn't going to be in college baseball, he'd go into pro ball and just learn more information, right? Almost, almost take a breather away from, from college baseball. But if the opportunity presented itself in college baseball, then he'd take it. And he called that, this, that. From the outside looking in, this is not that. From my perspective, from where I sit. And I'm, I'm not saying it f- that I don't think Monty's going to do a great job or isn't a great coach. I think he absolutely is. I think on paper, it's a really good hire for Mark Kingston. In reality, though, I, I don't know how this thing's going to work out. All right, let's see if we can get Third time's the charm here for Scotty. How's that? Did you pay, pay the cell phone bill now? Are we good? I, I, I swear to God, we do have cell service in Charleston. We just haven't uh, – we haven't had much luck with the uh, stream yard. I don't know what the deal is. Maybe are you paying your bill on stream yard is the question. Yeah, sure. Blame me. Classic media guy, Scotty. Blaming what? others, creating, making up your own narratives. I love it. I love it. As uh, you're yeah. on the yeah, as we're on the move. So, yep, no, we're good. I Hopefully can, you can hear me, and I can hear you. So that's always, uh, that's always a good thing. Okay, what do you think? Monty, back to Carolina after what you heard yesterday. I was just saying yeah. that on paper it seems like a really good hire, but in reality, man, uh, that it, it is going to be Monty and Mark Kingston. And at this position, at this place in Mark Kingston's career where it is win or there is going to be a change. I think we all understand that. that going into this season, Carolina baseball yeah. has to win and win at a high, high level. To me, that makes this not a no-brainer like Monty was talking about yesterday. I was a, a, a bit surprised to hear that. Maybe not surprised, but I'm not quite buying that, that it was an absolute no-brainer for Monty to do this, and, and now it's a kumbaya for Carolina baseball moving forward. Where are you? No, I, I don't agree with that. I, I mean, why wouldn't you take it if you're Monty? You've got a high Division One in your home state where you're most comfortable, where you want to live, uh, job. You're sure you're making six figures doing it. Plus, you got your buyout from Clemson. Why wouldn't you take it? If you get fired after this year, you get fired. Who cares? Then you do the professional baseball next year. Like, I don't I don't see what the – I don't see what the issue – I don't think Monty has the ego that, that – the head coaching ego, like I've got to be the head coach. I don't think Monty's got that at all. I think he's just a baseball guy who wants to be around baseball. So I don't see where there any part of this could be a losing thing for him. Look, if if that this staff gets fired after this year, people are not going to be like, you know, it's Monty Lee's fault. It was already broke. Uh, so at that point, if it was already broke, it's not like Monty Lee is tarnishing his image of one year being an assistant coach for South Carolina. I think if anything, it just it just helps his image if he shows up and they do really well. Maybe that opens him up for a head coaching job elsewhere next year. I don't know. Because it's such a relationship thing. That's why. 
Uh, Monty says that he and Mark Kingston had a good relationship while they were both yeah. coaches at Carolina and Clemson. But I, so, Scotty, I'm not saying this doesn't make sense for Monty Lee. I'm just saying this is something we have never seen ever a sitting Clemson head coach move over to Carolina. I know we had the Brad Scott situation back in the day. Football is different. Baseball, man, it is such a a game of decisions and scrutiny and Mark Kingston being in his career where it is. Now, DC says it's probably a job-saving hire for Kingston. So I, I, I get it, I guess, from the Mark Kingston <laughs> standpoint. But, Scotty, Ray Tanner is the athletics director. Monty Lee is Ray's guy. And now to have his guy come in, to me, this, it, 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 it seems like it could be a situation that it, it's not a natural fit to begin with, first of all. Anytime a Clemson head coach comes to Carolina, immediately after being fired is strange. I think we have to put that out there. I know, I know, yeah, Monty but I, I don't, I don't, out. I don't see this as like a Ray Tanner's guy sort of thing. Like, I don't see it as a Ray Tanner's guy thing because, like, Jim Tolman is Ray Tanner's guy, but Jim Tolman has not been that, you know, hired back as the head coach. And, you know, Mark Calvi is Ray Tanner's guy. No, Cal yeah, Calvi was Ray Tanner's guy and he's not there. And, you know, obviously, Stewart did not move up to be a, a head coach or, you know, whatever it may be. I, I don't see it being. Uh, like a Ray Tanner's guy thing. And I certainly don't think Monty's coming in to take the job because, uh, you know, he, I, I don't see that happening at all because if South Carolina wins this year, then Mark Kingston keeps his job. If South Carolina loses this year, you're not going to hire a guy who as your head coach who got fired at Clemson and then uh, turns around and didn't turn around South Carolina. So they're not going to hire Monty as the head coach next year if Kingston gets fired. So I don't, I don't see where, I don't see Ray, this playing into the Ray Tanner narrative at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, mean, I, I don't know. I just, I don't see it playing into any sort of Ray Tanner narrative. I see it turn. I, I see it as a win-win for Monty. I mean, there's no question for Monty. Why wouldn't you take it? And for Kingston, I, you know, I, one thing I will say is I talked to a ton of high school baseball coaches around our area, and, and it's like Mark Kingston never comes up in conversation, whereas Monty Lee does all the time. You know, like I feel like Monty's just got many more inroads with the high school coaches in our area. Uh, you know, I just he's been a coach in the state for 23 years. Kingston hasn't. I mean, K Kingston's kind of an outsider recruiting in. And Monty is an insider recruiting in. I mean, he's a, a born and raised South Carolina guy. So uh, Monty is so deeply connected in all three parts of the state. I mean, all three area codes. Monty is coached in all three area codes of the state. And he's so deeply tied in that uh, I, I think it's a win-win for Kingston. If it saves his job, then it saves his job. If it doesn't, it was a heck of a last-ditch effort. But you know, going in and recruiting, and Monty, people know Monty Lee's name a whole lot more than Chad Calais or whoever the guy was that, you know, that quit. Yep, completely agree with you on that last part. No doubt about it. I just think um, if this had happened sooner or at a different time, it would make a lot more sense. This timing seems uh, very interesting to me. I, I really uh, liked a couple of things that Monty had to say yesterday. Number one, dominate your role he said that's what he's going to do he's going to dominate his role and you could tell he had made this speech to his clemson teams a bunch of times right you got to know your role and then you got to dominate it uh did you take anything from that have you heard that one before i know you've you talked to monty a bunch when he was the the head coach at charleston there yeah no i've never heard the dominate your role but i, I yeah it was a good little mantra um no, I, I, I did not see this coming, but I certainly was not surprised when I saw the whole thing coming. And the press conference went, I mean, almost exactly as I thought it would go yesterday. I mean, Monty does win press conferences. I mean, he's a little long-winded for a TV guy. He's a little long-winded on the soundbite. But uh, he is, uh, he'll always shoot straight and he'll always be straight up with you and um, I, you know, I, I, you know, there's one thing that I, I do know about Monty. He's not a bullshitter at all. I mean, he is a guy who, who's straight up and will talk to you and tell you what's going on. I mean, I remember, you know, we were pretty close when he was at college of Charleston. We, you know, we dealt with each other a lot. And I remember when the negotiations with Clemson were going through, I mean, he was telling me, you know, every step of the way, what was going on. Uh, he was pretty, 
uh, pretty up on telling you what's going on. And uh, I remember the night he got hired, you know, he texted me and he said, look, it's official. And I, I said to him, I said, is it cool if we swing by your house and grab a quick soundbite? And he said, sure, no problem. And then it ended up, that was the night of the Emmanuel shooting. So we ended up talking about a half hour later and said, you know, it's uh, probably not a great idea that we do this interview tonight. There's a, a pretty bad night in Charleston going on right now. And, and uh, little did we know how bad it would become. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Monty has never beat around the bush. He's always just kind of straight up told you what's on his mind. So I, I believed everything he said yesterday. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not telling you that I didn't believe him. To me, this is uh, all about the, the comfort level of working in a situation that is clearly going to be highly pressurized. Like college baseball already is, right? When you're the head coach of the University of South Carolina, you already have to win at a very high level. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we've seen a season quite like this where it is pretty obvious to everyone that it, it it has to be at a certain level or there will be a change. That's all. The other thing that Monty mentioned yesterday that I love from a baseball perspective, you're either a buffalo or you're a deer. You ever heard yeah. that one? I never heard that never one. Never heard that one, but it does not surprise me that uh, he is, uh, you know, bringing up hunting references. That that does not surprise me at all. Uh, it's funny. I uh, I uh, was uh, over at um, uh, Edmonds O's Brewing on Sunday uh, or Saturday. I forgot. Saturday. I was over at uh, downtown on Upper King Street. It's like a cool brewery, you know, lunch spot. So we were over there on Saturday and we bumped into Kristen Smoke, Justin's wife. And uh, she was there with the kids and a friend. And I, I said, oh, I said, Justin, uh, Justin pumped about uh, about Monty coming back to, to Columbia. And she goes, oh, he's really excited because he has awesome hunting land. So Justin wants to go on his hunting land. I, I mean, like it turned to hunting before it ever turned to baseball. It was like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Justin's excited about his hunting land around Columbia. So that that's as far into the Monty Lee conversation as we got. But it was also the first thing that comes up with Monty Lee is hunting. Yeah, and Justin Smoke too. Hunting, fishing, yeah, yeah, whole yeah. thing. If you've ever been around uh, either one of those guys. Yeah. But but I guess that's kind of my point, Scotty. Monty is such a South Carolina guy. Mark Kingston is not. No, to right. combine both of those at this time seems like a very interesting marriage. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see how it plays out for sure. Again, uh, everybody, everybody's he, like you. Everybody loves Monty in the state of South Carolina. If, if Clemson fans don't wish their former head coach ill will going to South Carolina, you know he's got to be a, a bit of a prince of a guy. I've never seen anything on social media. By the way, I'm pulling in right now. I'm gonna go. I'm I'm gonna go for my little walk because I got a little time before uh, before okay. I gotta take my other before I gotta take my other kid to school. I'm, I'm gonna go for my little walk right now. So what you're just, seeing right now is Scotty can't sit still. It's impossible can't, for him. Can't sit still. So, um, so I. Uh, <laughs> so I. Uh, I'm, I'm a buffalo, and so I. I. I uh, no, I, I think the funny thing is, like, when I looked at it, and I, I don't, yeah, Monty is a prince of a guy. Like, he is, a, he is a good dude. I mean, I know Monty on the field, and I know Monty off the field, and Monty Lee is just a good dude. I don't know anybody that doesn't like Monty Lee. He treats people uh, just, he said it in his press conference yesterday, he just treats people the right way. Yep. And uh, there's no ego that comes along with him. I mean, I, I can tell you, I, I, you know, hands on fact, Monty Lee did not change one ounce from going as the College of Charleston's head coach to the Clemson head coach. Uh, he was as accessible anytime I texted him or called him, anytime he was as accessible as Clemson's head coach as he was as, as College of Charleston's. And that. I think there's something to be said about that. You know, when you go from being the College of Charleston's head coach to being a, a premier head coach in all of college baseball and your accessibility doesn't change at all, I think there's a whole lot to be said about that. No, I I understand what you're saying. And and and, and what I'm saying also is that I don't I've never heard bad things about Mark Kingston. Right. I've just never really heard good things about Mark Kingston. Yeah, you know, I just I it's just kind of like one of those neutral hires where if Mark Kingston left tomorrow, okay, 
I mean, I, okay, I, I, you know, if Mark Kingston stays, okay. But it's, you know, there's just, I, I don't think, Mark, uh, maybe the best way to say it, like, and I just see it in Charleston. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not in the, the hubbub of Columbia every day. But I can tell you, Mark Kingston doesn't move the needle. It's not like he tanks your ratings, but he just doesn't move the needle here. I, and I don't know how it is in Columbia, but he's kind of just a vanilla guy. He, he doesn't excite you on his interviews his press conferences. Uh, we don't know anything about him aside from baseball. Uh, he's not a social media guy. Uh, that's a, to me, a big thing is that he's not a social media guy. So you don't, you don't get to know him. I mean, there's something to be said about coaches on social media. Like you get to know them so much easier and quicker and kind of pick up on their personality. I mean, I think Shane Beamer is a great example of it that you just, you it's not that you feel like you're like friends with the person but at least you know a little bit about them outside of sports and um i i just mark kingston just doesn't push the needle to me in charleston it's not just in charleston i th I think that's who he is but as you were talking about that scotty do you do we know any baseball coaches who are big social media guys monty lee monty lee's on it all the time really okay monty monty's on twitter all the time yeah okay. i mean i know monty on twitter away. Monty's on Twitter. Stewart was on, yeah, Stewart was on Twitter. Uh, Chad Holbrook. Chad Holbrook is tremendously active on Twitter. He's on all the time. Uh, I mean, Chad Holbrook is, is tweeting constantly. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I do think if you look, I mean, Gary Gilmore, in this state, Gary Gilmore is not a Twitter guy. Uh, but, like, Tony Skoll at Citadel, yes, Twitter. Mark McMillan at CSU, yes, on Twitter. Monty on Twitter. Uh, Stewart was on Twitter, Jim Toman, who is not in the state anymore, but is deeply tied, big Twitter guy, Holbrook, big Twitter guy, uh, Brett Harker, big Twitter guy. So yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I have more association with all of those coaches, even though I don't know all of them than I do with Mark Kingston. I just feel like in this day and age, there's, 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 there's more than just the X's and O's of baseball. And I, I, social media has a lot to do with that to me. And especially with kids in high school who you're recruiting because they're all on social media. They kind of want to know uh, a little bit about you who's recruiting them. Well, pretty fascinating, right? Uh, what you're talking about. I agree with you about Mark Kingston, Lamont Paris, the new Carolina basketball coach uh, kind of famously was not even on Twitter until he came to South Carolina. So right. clearly that's not a requirement from a Ray Tanner higher standpoint. I think from a baseball standpoint, you get credit for being, that guy you're talking about, someone who doesn't move the needle. It's not about you. You're really strong and steady if you're winning games, right? If you're not winning right. games, then it's, hey, and especially when you're coming into the program, how he came into the program at the kind of tumultuous post-Chad Holbrook time. And it was odd for me at the time to see Ray Tanner go outside the, the family, outside the network. And um, yeah, I, I think by and large, it's impossible to say that it has worked out well to this point, and then you inject Monty Lee into it. Just the timing of the whole thing is the most interesting part to me. Speaking of that, uh, Scotty, being a native New Yorker, did you see the New York moment that has social media up in in arms? Yes, the, uh, yes, the hot dog beer thing. The hot yes. dog beer thing. Tell oh, me. Let, let's tell everybody I, about it first. So first of all. Subway series can't going you, down. Can't you can't you show it? Can't don't you have the capability to show it on yep. your yard? You to do it right now. You calling you calling for me to 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 show it right I, now. I huh? think you got to show it just because it was so ridiculous. <laughs> so the the my kids popped it on yesterday. My kids are big Aaron Judge fans. I know we've we've had the story on the program. I know you put it on the news there. Stuart Lake and his time in Charleston throwing batting practice to Aaron Judge when he was a River Dog, right? Yep. And yep. Uh, one of the reasons why I respect my wife as much as I do, she's from Connecticut, and she leans Mets over Yankees. That was a big, that was a big, uh, big pick for her early on in the process. A big pick for me. I I very much appreciated that. Uh, but last night I was pulling for the Yankees for the first time, maybe in my life because of just the, the brave situation. All right. 
This is from John Boy Media. I got it pulled up here, Scotty. Hold on just a second. Yeah, so now, now we're probably disturbing. getting greedy. We're, we got you on your video on the walk. Yep. And now I'm going to try to pull up video from Twitter as well. Well, this thing, this whole thing will probably crash within uh, no time. No, here. I want to see this. I want to see right. this. That's why I'm. All right. Let's see if we got it. Okay. We got it pulled got up it. there. Now I'm going to just play it in the, play it in my Twitter here. Check Go out full this. screen on the Twitter. Go full screen on the Twitter. All it makes right. it bigger. Yeah, so bossy, man. There you go. Is that helping you out? We're good. Yeah, you yeah, have, yeah, it hasn't yeah, died. Yeah. All right, from yeah, John no, Boy Media, just a dude sitting in the seats, right? Was this is that City Field? I'm guessing by all the Mets yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's disturbing. Okay, Yankees hat, just to kind of being himself here, and then here we go. Oh God. Did you guys I, see that? So he All right. dug it, out the he dug out the hot dog and then he put it in as a straw. I mean, is that what I saw correctly? Correct. That's exactly what I saw. Yeah, that's yeah. what I saw. First of all, I mean, I first of all, who drinks beer out of a straw? I mean, think that's the biggest Great point. The, the biggest question I have there is who drinks beer out of a straw. The second question I have in this situation is what the hell is he thinking? <laughs> First of all, Scotty, I think you're too you're being too kind on drinking beer out of a straw. I think as a male, you should not be using a straw unless you are in a travel type situation where it's it you're just avoiding a, a spill. If you I, opt for the straw at the restaurant with no lid situation, you're suspect to me. I, uh, I'm I will are you say a straw this: I'm, I'm not anti. I'm not anti straw, but here's here's what I am. I I. I I will honestly say I outwardly I I make a conscious decision not to go to restaurants that use the paper straws. I make a conscious decision. <laughs> if there is two places and one you I know uses the paper straws and the other one uses plastic straws, I'm going plastic straws ten times out of ten. Same there is a I have a tremendous there's a there's a place in town. I love the place. Uh, it's called Kairos. I think you might have one in Colombia now. It's like a Mediterranean, like Moe's sort of situation where like you go up and you, you know, like pitas and you, but you pick what you want on them like at Moe's. And I love Kairos, but there's a, a, another place called Kava that's kind of like, like it, but not exactly, but kind of like it. Kava goes plastic straws. Kairos goes paper straws. Kava is one more mile from my station than Kairos. I have stopped going to Kairos. I go to Kava because of the plastic straws. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So are you e eating en route always? Why, why does the straw come into the equation here is my question. Yeah, because I'm 95% of the time bringing it in the car and I want my drink in the car. So I want a straw, but I don't want to get talking? halfway. I just said you never sit still. Of course you're eating en route. Of course you're moving when you're eating not one and there's nothing worse than you get a nice cold drink on a hot day and then that straw starts disintegrating halfway through the drink there's nothing worse than that it is the worst the absolute worst uh and, and I, I mean i love the environment i'm walking in the environment right now look it's the sky it's the trees but i, I just give me a damn plastic straw holy shit <laughs> I love it, Scotty. Teddy D's with you. He says, yes, the paper straws are trash. I'm with you on this one. Plastic all the way. Uh, DC says he's with me. Apparently, just pretty much anti-straw. Craig goes, great point for Craig, straw only with a milkshake. And these places that are so uh, proud of their thick milkshakes that you can't even uh, get get into it with a straw at first, you got to go spoon. I don't when, Wendy's, Wendy's Frosty is not a milkshake. Wendy's right. Frosty is an ice cream. It's ice. And this is where I was going to go eventually with this, right? This is where I'd like you guys to go the next step with me. Scotty, maybe you can start us off. And since you brought that up organically, it, it makes a lot of sense. The only thing creatively I've done anywhere close to this, and it's not close to this, I think this is this is somewhere, it's either genius or it's a travesty. I'm not sure which, the hot dog straw. 
I don't know. I'm still trying to wrap. I think that guy's just like a crackhead. He's not. I mean, he's like an anomaly. He's. I I think he's just a total anomaly (laughs) person. Well, clearly he's an anomaly. I mean, that's usually what they say about geniuses, Scotty, in their time, Uh, especially at the beginning. But how about the angle of that thing? The the execution. I'm calling that this was a bit of a setup. Somebody came up with this. I think this was contrived. There's no way that dude was just sitting there and this just happened to happen. And they happened to get that angle on it on social media. I am very, um, uh, my, my radar is up. I'm very skeptical about this whole thing, but yes, the Wendy's frosty, you brought it up. That's the only creative thing I've ever done with food my whole life. You ever did dipping the fries into the frosty back in the day. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, I wouldn't exactly call that a creative genius. I mean, how, that's, uh, how dare you? Cross that's a pretty, it's a pretty, it's a pretty standard, standard operating procedure. Of I, I thought I was being creative. I've gotten some terrible feedback on that. Like, oh, that's gross. How can you do it? Never heard of that. Okay, fine. I used to. I'll yeah. tell you what, though. Like, I used to love Wendy's. Love Wendy's. I haven't gone to Wendy's in probably two to three years. Because both Wendy's and Mount Pleasant are like basically across the street from a uh, uh, Chick Fil A, and there's always one person working at Wendy's, and it takes three and a half hours. And Chick Fil A is the most efficient operation in the history of operations. You got four kids outside with iPads. Wendy's, there's like one guy making the. It takes forever. I'm like, I, you know, time is money, people. Time is money, and. I just, I can't do, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do Wendy's. I'll pay the extra two, three bucks at Chick-fil-A for the efficiency of Chick-fil-A. I'm, I'm with you completely. And I'm glad you're coming in hot today, Scotty. I love it. You're, you're getting out the toxins while you're walking and you're getting out your bitterness uh, with your, your gas baggy hot takes. Good times. Somebody was asking here, uh, where's you, where are you walking to? You're not walking anywhere, right? Just I'm just, exercise, yeah, I just exercise. Yeah, yeah, just exercise. I just, I walk my neighbor. I do five miles in the morning. So, I, uh, I have my daughter. So my one daughter is in school. My other daughter starts full time school on Thursday. Uh, but I, my wife will watch her until my wife goes to work at home. She works from home, so she's got the other daughter right now. And then I will uh, take her out of the house and hope it doesn't rain and kill time, so she doesn't totally wreck my wife's work day. So. That's uh, that's kind of how we roll. So I, I have this hour I can get my walk in and and that's usually what I do. Perfect. So l- let's get straight here. You're, you are anti hot dog straw. Is that where you're well, going? Yeah. To? And I also couldn't imagine going to City Field and paying 10 to 12 dollars for a hot dog and then using it as a straw. Like, why are you digging out the, the meat of the hot dog if you're paying for? I mean, that's not like going to. uh you know, that's not like going to uh, what's the name of that place in Columbia, Sandy's, and getting uh, you know be. getting a dollar hot dog or whatever it may be. That, that that hot dog is costing a whole lot more than Sandy's hot dog is costing. I think Sandy's has been gone now for a little while there on Main Street, I, I believe. Just to let is you it? know, oh, that was a, that guy. was like a staple, that was yeah. like a staple place, a hot dog and ice cream. Absolutely. I remember I used to, my dad used to take me to the bookstore there on uh, main street yeah. and that would be part of it. And we'd make him get, get us ice cream. That was the whole deal. All right. But, but Scotty, you're, you're missing out a little bit. That was an efficient operation that we saw. Like the, that wasn't, he didn't remove much meat at all. And I'm guessing let's take it to the next step. What happens with the hot dog when the beer is gone? I guess you, it's like a beer hot dog. Like, you know, people make like, you know, beer brat. So don't, don't like in like Wisconsin, they take a brat and they boil beer and then they, they cook the brat in the beer. Exactly. So that's my point that I think it, it, it might be genius. I, I think what I have to do before I weigh in on this one way or another, like, believe me, it freaks me out again. I, I'm on the record. I am an anti straw guy in general, only yep. in travel situations. The fact that this has happened blows my mind. But I, I think to get a full, fully formed opinion on this, that it has to be experienced because I don't know, maybe, maybe at the end of that beer, that hot dog turns out to be the best hot dog in the history of hot dogs. I don't know. It's possible. You're not it's very it? possible. Okay, you're leaving. At least you're leaving some room for the possibility. What an open mind. I mean, guy. part of me says, why don't you, uh, I, I mean, I, part of me says he is, he is doctoring the hot dog to get it into 
like beer brat fashion because otherwise you could have left the straw in the hot dog, drank the beer through the straw in the hot dog if you just wanted to be crazy. But right. you know, he wanted to he wanted to infuse the hot dog with some sort of a, a beer product. Exactly. Which I mean, in theory, that I would be all for. All right. Well, so you're you're knocking my creativity with Wendy's Frosty and Fries. So what do yeah. you have? What what's your creative move with food in your lifetime, sir? I know you're a big bagel guy. You got a bagel move that you can tell us about that nobody else does, or you you feel no. is creative, or you got absolutely nothing and you're just criticizing this morning. Where are we at? Uh, no, I'm not really creative with any. I don't I don't see myself as being like not, you know I'm not I don't <laughs> see fries in a frosty is uh, d- doesn't the. Uh, doesn't the guy who sings the Applebee's song that, uh, you know, that Walker Hayes guy, doesn't he sing about my fries and a frosty in that, in that song? I don't care, Scotty. I was doing this in the eighties. Okay. Probably before you were born or right. right if it's, if it's in a, if it's in a popular country song that my four-year-old knows the words to, it's not that off the wall. I'm not saying it was that off the wall. I'm just saying like it dip, it like my fries, dip it like my fries in a frosty. <laughs> Yeah, he sings about dipping his fries in a frosty on the on the Applebee's song. I would have no idea um, if you say so. Well, I, I'm telling you. Um, no, I no, I'm not really creative with any of my foods. I don't do anything. I like to like experiment. I'm a big air fryer guy, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not crazy like you know weird about things. It's just kind of relatively normal. I'm. I'm How dare you? You're I'm, not creative, is what I'm hearing. You have no creativity when it comes to food. Great. Yeah. No, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'll eat anything, but, uh, you know, maybe I'm not as creative. I, I, you know, what you would have loved. I went to dinner. I went to dinner on uh Sunday night. My best friend from childhood is in town in Charleston and he, you know, he wanted to kind of do like a dining experience. So we, uh, we did, uh, we, we, it, you have to call you know, way a month or two ahead of time to get a reservation, but we did get a reservation at our kitchen. And it's uh, it's pretty fantastic. So we did uh, we did the I don't know have you have you heard of our kitchen? I'm not a Charleston guy. You're doing a Charleston thing right now. I feel like this is a Charleston thing to go to the the exclusive place to eat. It is not exclusive at all. Not no? exclusive at did, all. Did you just say you got to call a month ahead of time? Isn't that you the do. definition you of exclusive? Do. But but uh, what it is, our kitchen is. Um, it's a little. There's two of them. There's one in West Ashley and there's one in downtown. And they are a little like they look like a shack. Both of them look like downtown. It's just like this old, kind of rundown looking house in West Ashley on sixty one. It's the exact same thing, and it is a chef's kitchen. Um, so whatever ingredients are there, or whatever ingredients the two chefs want to pick up on their way in, they pick up. And so two chefs make a five course meal. It's sixty bucks five course meal. And you do not know what you're getting. It's a completely blind tasting. And then at each course, the chef comes out and tells you exactly what they made, why they made it, how they made it, and whatever. Now, the one in West Ashley is bring your own beer. It's a BYOB place. So they cook a five-course meal, and you bring your own booze, and they give you wine. Uh, Downtown, you've got to buy the booze there. But whatever. I mean, it's, it's fine. But uh, yeah, it's sick. It's awesome. And so you do not know, but they kind of come up with whatever kind of crazy creations that they could make. And so, uh, I mean, it's delicious. The, the food is fresh. It's awesome. And, uh, and so it reminded me of that because on Sunday night, uh, we got to our final dessert course. And it was, it was a, a watermelon sorbetto, I believe it was called. And so the guy made, you know, he made his homemade whipped cream and he made some sort of like a, a watermelon ice. And he goes, and the secret ingredient, I tossed a little Gatorade in there. I was like, damn. <laughs> and the Gatorade, I think, gave it a little pop and it was delicious. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to get. But the, a little Gatorade <laughs> tossed into the watermelon sorbetto was outstanding. All right. So from an eating standpoint, you're adventurous. You'll eat anything from eat a anything, yeah. creative standpoint or uh, making something. You got nothing. That's what I'm hearing. I got nothing. Yeah, All right. yeah that's, exactly. I think that's very fair. Uh, what What about uh, Jordan Montgomery? You seen, seen what he's been doing here lately? Yeah. Charleston resident Jordan Montgomery. Uh, yeah. 99 pitches last night. Pretty darn impressive for the uh, 
former River Dog, former Gamecock, and uh, and Charleston resident. He was uh, he was outstanding last night, man. I mean, yeah, that's that is Greg Maddox esque, uh, throwing under a hundred pitches in a complete game. I saw Maddox esque. I got to give him more of the Glavin um, comparison, being the lefty. But for a guy that has, I mean, he's a quiet guy. He's a he's a really quiet personality. If you've ever been around Jordan Montgomery, you know he's the opposite of what you would think of for a New York Yankee, or at least what I would think of. Brett Gardner, oh, God, yeah. Brett Gardner, kind of the same way, right? Those guys are, are really. I mean, they're South Carolina. All of them, team. yeah. All oh, the yeah. South Carolina guys. Gardner's, J.P. Sears was on the Yankees. Really quiet, kind of subdued guy. Uh, Montgomery, kind of a quiet, subdued guy. Yeah, it's very weird how the Yankees, you know, in the middle of the Bronx, they, they're they bringing in kind of like these quiet South Carolina guys. But, uh, yeah, I agree with you on that completely. Yep, and uh, Anthony weighing in. Gumby pitched to Maddox last night going old school. Um, oh, Craig's wanted to make sure that you knew that he's had our kitchen three times. You don't pick your menu. You eat what they cook that day, the five-course meal. So uh, maybe you that's can – That's what I said. Tell, tell right. Craig that's what I said. You don't no, know if you're knows. blind. You... I'm just a little yeah, late don't... popping it in, just a little late popping in. So I need to know what what else you've had as the main course. What have you had as the main course? What was the, what was the main course the other night? Uh, so the other night it was uh, – so it started with um, a tomato bisque soup that – uh, the guy, the chef said he stopped on his way in at this farm stand. He was on his way back into town. He stopped at this farm stand, started talking about, you know, whatever. And so he brought these awesome heirloom tomatoes back and he made like a tomato bisque with uh, like chunks of beef in it. It was delicious. Uh, second one was a, a salad with a plum vinaigrette. Uh he made it with fresh plums and it was uh, and like strawberries and stuff like that on the salad. And then the third course was um, a pork tenderloin, like a pork kind of medallion uh, with a fig and jalapeno jam on the on the plate. And then a vegetable salad over a spring rice. It was like a green looking rice. It was made with cucumbers. It was delicious. That was third course. Fourth course was uh, like a uh, like a Vietnamese pho with uh, with like rice noodles, shrimp, and kind of a spicy broth. And then the fifth course was uh, this watermelon sorbetto with a homemade whipped cream and mint on top. Now, what makes it a sorbetto as opposed to a sorbet? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> couldn't you. tell you. Yeah, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> DC. But yeah, going- it, it's. The most creative thing DC came up with is the neighbors at our lake house put peanuts in their cokes. How about that? That's interesting. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting. You never heard of that one? I think that's a southern thing. Yeah, yeah, Roger said he used to do that as well, especially the the six point five ounce ones. If you guys have any other uh, creative food items, creative uh, creative creations, I don't think we're going to go with that. But while we're doing that, the stat for Jordan Montgomery, you might want to throw out there the nugget I saw. Fernando Valenzuela, the last guy, first four starts with a team, just one earned run. 19, That's unreal. 1981. Is that the year you were born? You probably yeah, I was born in, no, I was born in 83. 83. Unbelievable. So, yeah, Jordan Montgomery, clearly the – I know he was upset about it. I know he didn't like it. He, he probably didn't even see it coming, right? Uh, the the trade to St. Louis, but clearly that's working out well, man. And if there was uh, yeah. ever a personality that I would say fits with a baseball town, I think it is Jordan Montgomery in St. Louis, man. They love baseball there, but it is very, it's a, you know, he is, he strikes me as kind of a Midwest taking to the Midwest kind of guy. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, I mean, there's, he's just going to absolutely love that. It's not going to be the critical take on every pitch like it is in New York. You know, I think the, a lot more supportive, a lot less critical in uh, in St. Louis, and and I, you know, I can tell you, his manager is a a heck of a well-respected guy, uh, Oliver Marmel, College of Charleston Hall of Famer, is their uh, is their manager. I think he's the youngest manager in the majors. Really well respected. Just, I mean, he's just worked his way up through that organization. Um, Oliver Marmel was a College of Charleston player when I got here, and now he's, uh, you know, now he's there. It's a it's a pretty that's a pretty good uh, ascension of the ranks for uh, for Ali Marmel. No doubt about it. You got you got anything on their pitching coach? Because I'm guessing he came up with something mechanically that has helped Jordan Montgomery out. Clearly, has helped him out. Do you know you know who their I pitching am, coach is off the top of the head? No, no idea. Right. No idea. And and, and Ali is not a pitching guy. I mean, he's, right. he's a 
you know, hitting guy. So I you know I, I have no idea who their pitching coach is, but uh, whatever they do, whatever they did, or maybe it's just the you know the pressure of the pressure of the Bronx. You you, you transform that, go to St. Louis. It just maybe seems just like a weight off your shoulders every time you take the mound. It could be. Uh, I'm seeing Mike Maddox actually is the pitching coach over there. So maybe that's oh, the one reasons that we we saw. Let, let me make sure that these things are right. No, I think this is old school right right now. It looks like that that might be a little bit uh, previous. Yep, I see. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get this going here in a second. I want to confirm that as we're doing it on the fly live. As Scotty is on the move, talking about former Gamecock Jordan Montgomery. Uh, just one quick aside: if only thing you need to know about Jordan Montgomery to know he's a, a good dude is doing a, a children's hospital radiothon and talk to him as part of that. And he 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 had gone and played Uno with kids. Like that's kind of his deal. He goes and plays Uno with kids at the children's hospital. If you can get I also thought it was pretty cool know. when the I thought it was pretty cool last year when the kids at the uh, Sumter High School baseball team showed up and there was a pair of cleats for all of them from Jordan Montgomery. I thought that was pretty cool last year. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Saw him win the state title back in the day uh, at Sumter High School many, many years ago. The Carolina career, strong as well. And now, wow, after the scenery change, impressive stuff. Are your Mets going to choke here down the stretch? How are you feeling about it? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what's going to happen. It's been very much up and down. I was all in when the Braves were in New York, and then kind of the tides turned when they came to Atlanta. Uh, now it's the Subway Series. I I don't know what to expect. I really don't. Uh, obviously, they got a big home run yesterday. And, uh, you know, with the Grom pitching, if they can just give him damn run support, then it'll be it'll be all right. But, uh, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Oh, I'm just seeing your tweet now. I'm impressed. You haven't even mentioned this about T.J. Hopkins getting called up to, to AAA there. And this is in the Cardinals organization, right? Uh, uh, Reds. Ah, oh, the Reds. They have the. I thought Louisville was always the the Cardinals AAA. Maybe I screwed that up. They've been flipping that thing all over the place. Anyway, good for T.J. Hopkins, another former Gamecock in the big leagues. There, uh, he has gotten jacked, man. I don't know if you've seen T.J. Hopkins, but he's. I mean, I remember him being a little. I mean, he he had some power at South Carolina, but he's turned into a power hitter. Uh, right. I think he's got sixteen or seventeen home runs in AA this year uh, with Chattanooga and. Uh, uh, yeah, I saw his dad. Um, if I could, if I could minimize this, I could read you the. Could you still see me? Could you still hear me? Let's see. I, I was checking out Twitter as well. Yep, you're good there. No, I saw the tweet. Uh, his dad just pop, popped out as well. Go ahead, if you want. You saw the one. You, you saw. You saw the one from his dad. Uh, yeah. From his. Got a phone uh, call around midnight. My yeah. boy is on the way yeah. to AAA Louisville. Way to go, TJ! And a boom from Timothy Hopkins. It's just crazy now. And yeah, it looked like when you tried to pull up your Twitter, that's where you're you're spazzing out on us there with the the internet this morning. But the Braves yeah. now three games back of the Mets, by the way. After the Mets lose last night, Braves win in Pittsburgh two to one. The stat from the Braves perspective, first time in organization history, I think, with back to back series wins against teams that are at least thirty games over five hundred when they took three out of four. From the Mets and two out of three from the Astros here. Obviously, the Pirates not quite that uh, type of organization. Yeah, no, it's pretty pretty cool. So uh, fun to watch. I love watching Vaughn Grissom and uh, you know Mike Harris and the the newcomers on the Braves. Man, are are fun and I I don't have a doubt in saying that Alex Anthopoulos is the best GM in baseball. I really do think he is the uh, he is the epitome of a, a GM that looks forward and locks things down for the future and uh, taps into that local market. And I, I think Anthopolis does everything uh, baseball-wise kind of the right way. He's, he's a really good GM. I don't think anybody that follows the Braves would have thought after winning the World Series that not signing Freddie Freeman would turn out to be looking as good as it has for Atlanta yep. in the big picture. Matt Olson, Matt Olson has gotten... Uh, the Braves off of uh, off of the hook uh, in a big time way. There's no question about that. Poor Anthony, good call there, Craig, uh, the Pirates fan, the resident Pirate fan on the the show here. And Roger weighing in with the St. Louis is the best baseball town in Major League Baseball. Would you agree? I would agree with that, Roger. Well yeah. done. Yeah, I would agree. It's great stuff. Um, uh, Chicago's close. Chicago's close. Boston's close, but. Uh, 
you know, I, I would say St. Louis, Chicago, Boston, all three are pretty darn good baseball towns. All right. The talk in Boston is about Tom Brady. What do you make of the 11 day personal break? Because I feel like this is where you go strong with you. How can you do that? You got to the team dynamic, the whole thing. I, I got zero problem with Tom Brady playing. I got zero. Teams. No, I'm, I'm with you. I got zero problem, too. Uh, he, he, you earned that, man. You earned that. You know, I had uh, I had somebody at work the other day say, man, like you take a lot of vacation, dude. And I was like, you know what? Damn right I do. You know why? Because I've worked here for 16 years and I've earned five weeks of vacation. You've been here for two weeks and uh, you haven't earned six weeks of vacation or whatever it is. So damn straight, I'm going to take my vacation. I'm a team player when I'm here. But I'm not going to apologize for taking vacation that I've earned by sticking it out for 15, 16 years. I mean, that's I'm I I mean, obviously, I'm not Tom Brady and I'm not Tom Brady to our operation at all. But I still feel the same way. Like you, you, you earn things in your time in a position and longevity earns some personal time. And uh, granted, my vacation was. Uh, with two kids and going to Canada, his was like uh, on an exclusive island in the Bahamas with Giselle. But that's besides the point. I, I, oh, I think he's earned it. I'm fine with that. If they, Look, he's fine without playing football. He's going to do just fine. If, if the Buccaneers didn't want him, if the Buccaneers didn't want him to take a vacation, then don't bring in Tom Brady. You know, sucks. But if you have that ability to take it, and that time is in essence your time, and take it. I'm going to get back to Gamecock football in just a second. Other NFL headline yesterday, Carolina Panthers naming Baker Mayfield the starting quarterback. What's your take, Scott? Uh, I mean, I'm not in practices, but, uh, I'm, yeah, I mean, you brought in Baker Mayfield. I think you should uh, you know, give him a chance. It's not like Sam Darnold is a world beater by any stretch. He'll be a very capable backup. Uh, I'm fine with Mayfield being the starter. I mean, obviously, Matt Rule sees him every snap of every practice, so. I got no problem with that decision. To me, this thing was already decided a long time ago. They went through a little kabuki theater saying, no, no, you got to go earn it and the whole deal. And now that that seemingly is the narrative, right, where you build it up and you you give your your resident quarterback at least a shot out there. You don't throw him under the bus and um, just make him disgruntled. We'll be fascinating to see how this th- this position And this relationship moves forward as well. Mayfield and Darnold. And he's got to be a lot better than the the Carolina Panthers quarterback has been in a while for the Panthers to be relevant. I I still think they got a long way to go. They got to have a gap to be healthy. And Mayfield's got to be kind of the best version of himself most of the time. Otherwise, the the margin of error just isn't there. I don't think their defense is going to be as good as it was. And they got to make a bunch of plays to be relevant in the NFL. And they've also got to save Matt Rule's job. If he wants his job next year, they got to win. I mean, there's, he, 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 if they don't win this year, I don't know if he makes it to the end of the year. And, uh, you know, we've seen David Tepper as an owner. He is not a patient one. Uh, didn't he fire his soccer coach like 10 games into their inaugural season? Like, yeah, he is not a patient, patient man with winning. Uh, I think, you know, Rule's got to win now if he wants to keep his job in Carolina. Totally agree. Let's get back to the Gamecocks. Cam Smith uh, making another preseason All-American team. This time it's the second team for the Associated Press. Plenty of preseason accolades for him personally. I'd, you've seen some are across the board for the Gamecocks. W- where you got him, Scotty, this year? I'm a 7-5 and five guy. What about you? I'm with you. I'm with you right around 7-5. and five. I, that, I no, Yeah, I, I, I would feel confident in that. I'm, you know, Confident in, uh, you know, p- pulling off a big win or two like they have in the past, uh, like with Shane Beamer last year, where they beat Florida and they beat who was the other big win they had? Auburn. Um, Auburn. And then I would think that, you know, uh, they they could let one slip like they always do. Uh, the normal ones, Georgia's beating them. I mean, uh, Tennessee will be an interesting one this year. Don't really know what to expect from Tennessee. Uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I would think seven and five is a very fair assessment, normal, lower end bowl game. Um, but you know, if they overachieve a little bit, then Shane Beamer goes down as just this, uh, you know, this legend of turning things that quickly. And 
Look, I, I don't know. I mean, all you read about on Twitter is all these recruits he's pulling in left and right and left and right. Now, I don't know the quality versus the quantity. I, I don't know how good they are. I mean, how, how much stock do you put in stars and everything like that? But he seems to be getting the guys he puts a target on. Like, he seems to be getting them. And in that being said, if you could just build, if you could be seven and five this year, uh, maybe eight and four, eight and four would be tremendously good. I don't know if that's going to happen, but if you could pull that off and then have the momentum you have from recruiting, then I really think the future's, you know, pretty darn bright. See if you see it like I do. I see it the the twelve games schedule separated in thirds. Four games you should win, four games you're likely to lose, and then four very much in the middle. So the four games you you're, should you're win. You're losing, you're losing. Go ahead. Uh, win, Georgia, Georgia State, obviously a win. Vanderbilt, a win. Uh, what are the other two you have as a total win? Oh, the, 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 the non-D1 game and Charlotte the fourth the one you have. Charlotte, Charlotte and okay. South Carolina State. Yep. Okay, the four you're okay. likely to lose. Do you know those? Uh, Clemson. Uh, Clemson for sure, Georgia for sure. A and M, and what would the fourth one be? As a, as a, you're going to Arkansas. Lose I put in there as well. On oh, the road. that's an interesting one. Oh yeah, Ar- they never win at Arkansas on the road. The the one time I pointed out on the show a couple of times is uh, what the the week after Clowney sat out against Wofford and Spurrier was all mad at him and they go out there and absolutely embarrass Brett Bielema and <laughs> Spurrier comes in the post game press conference like it's never fun to get your butt beat that's what I told Brett after the game <laughs> and he <then it> comes <laughs> off Steve Spurrier esque so yeah but the re- that's one of the reasons I put it out there so then, also so then your middle then mentioned. your middle of the road ones would be Kentucky Tennessee. Uh, your your maybe your maybes would be Kentucky, Tennessee. You have Vanderbilt as a maybe. Nope, they were they were in that first category. You oh, mentioned they were in that first category. Okay, so you got uh, so oh. Kentucky, Tennessee. Um, I love playing this game. Everybody's playing it along with you. They're just yelling at you uh, right now, Scotty. Two other. I'm on my walk trying to think. Yep, it's the best. Uh, play you think. To th- oh, Florida, oh, Florida, Florida, and Florida's a maybe and. Kentucky, Tennessee, Florida, and... It's perfect. This is the other team that everybody forgets about in the SEC. Missouri. Yep, you got it. So is that fair? You you see those differently? Would you put one... Would you take that no. Arkansas game out of that likely loss and move it in the middle? Well, I think that Arkansas game is the one that's going to go between 8-4 and four and 7-5. and five. I mean, that's the one that's going to be the key one between you know, shit bowl game and a decent bowl game. I think, I think that Arkansas game has got to be the swing game. Then, you know, if they hold, hold serve on the rest of them, Arkansas turns out being the biggest game of the year as that swing game. If they could win that heck, if they win Arkansas and they win Tennessee, then you, then you're talking like, man, Shane Beamer is what a job he's done. If They could swing both of those games, both of those swing games. If they could swing them as wins, it's like, man, Shane Beamer is, is the real deal. Well, that's the only way you get to have a special season, right, with this math. Because remember, if we're talking those four toss-up games, Tennessee beat the tar out of South Carolina last year. I was yes. very clear about that. So to have it as a toss-up game, I think, is can be a kind, uh, a kind spot for it to fall. Florida, no one in Florida expects the Gators to lose to the Gamecocks in the swamp in year number one under Billy Napier. Billy Napier, right. correct. Yep, I'm, yep. I'm with you on that one. So, but uh, doing the math, though, A&M, Scotty. I, I mean, if, if I'm A&M going A&M seven and five, there, Scotty, I'm going seven and five. If I'm doing the math, then Carolina's got to win three out of four of those swing games, of those ones that are toss-ups in the middle. Correct. Yes. Yes. You know, you're right about that, no doubt. Uh, yeah, yeah I, mean, you're right. I mean, as far as the must, as far as the they're going to lose games, I, I don't see them beating Clemson. Uh, I don't see them beating Georgia. And then A&M looks quite strong from everything you've seen. And, uh, you know, so when you look at those, that those are going to be three really tough ones. The Arkansas, Arkansas is the one. I mean, Arkansas, if you've got Arkansas as a loss, that's the one that, that has to end up being the winnable one. Yeah, to me, not not necessary. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, that would be massive. Uh, Roger correctly points out 0-8 versus Texas A&M all time. 
is a, another reason why I have that in the likely loss category. I agree. Tim Brando, I think, I think was on the show yesterday calling him overrated. I agree. I think they're overrated, but they, they still uh, have to, it, that has to be proven to me that Carolina can beat Texas A&M. It has not proven to be a good matchup the last several years. The greatest win ever against Texas A&M was your dad wearing the mask on TV. Absolutely. He's not afraid to go to College Station and make an an impression, is he? Oh, look at that. And then Scotty goes, he loses the connection immediately after that, or or maybe just hit a button on the phone there. All right, so you're going... What did you say? Nothing, nothing, nothing that needs to be repeated for sure. You just went black all okay. of a sudden after you said that. I thought my uh, my pops might have that kind of pull on the show. Oh. <laughs> all right. So yesterday I did uh, peaks and valleys. Most confident, least confident. If you have to choose okay. one thing you're most confident about Gamecock football going into the 2022 season, what is it? And on the other side, one thing that you are the least confident in that will go well, I guess, from the Carolina standpoint. What do you got? Most confident, Spencer Rattler. Least confident, special teams without uh, without Kai Kroger to start with and without a, a proven kicker. Whoa, uh, you you can't just gloss over that Spencer Rattler thing. I, w- I need to hear more there because that I put him down on on the valley. I put him down in the least confident thing. I I, no. I am fascinated to he's hear. He's got that. control of that team. He's got control of that team. He knows what he's doing. Uh, I have no qualms in saying he's the one of the best quarterbacks they've ever brought in. It's going to be a step up from what it, what it was. Spencer Rattler will handle that offense. There's no doubt in my mind. Spencer Rattler will handle that offense. No question uh, in my mind. I, I, he's one, I mean, he's, if you can't win with a guy, if you can't, you know, if a guy who you recruit is probably the best quarterback recruit you've ever brought in, if you're not confident in that, you'll never be confident in the Gamecocks team, right? Quarterback and team is a little different. When you say he's got a handle on the offense, what what kind of offense are we going to see? We didn't see a good one. We don't know. Year. We don't know. We don't. We don't know. We don't know. And that's a that's why I got. I that's why I have zero confidence in it. Yeah, but right? I have confidence he'll he'll deliver in whatever situation he's put into. I think he'll deliver. I really do. I think so. I think he. he you know, look, Satterfield is. You know, he was on the hot seat last year. I think he's gonna. If there's, if you have any confidence whatsoever in Satterfield, you have confidence that he's going to tailor this thing to make it work for Spencer Rattler and the skill set that Rattler has. I, I, I really, I really do think that. Wow! And special teams on a on a Beamer coached college football team—that's where your least confidence goes because the punter has a has a bum foot. And again, what kicker do you have that has any experience? You win and lose games on a kicker, Tim. You win and lose games on a kicker, and you don't have Parker White anymore. There's no experience at kicker. I, I, yes, I worry. Why wouldn't you worry about that? Why wouldn't you worry about that? That's where you win and lose games. How many games have been won or lost by Parker White? I think he had like maybe three in his entire 17 year career. Was it three games that he won? I, I could tell you that last year, last year, the trajectory of last year's season changes completely without that ECU. No doubt. I give you that one. Did you lose me there? Yeah, just for a second. You said ECU game. I give you Louisiana Tech a couple of years beforehand. Uh, Outside of that, it hadn't been a kicker-based type win or lose situation. And the, the punting deal, come on, man. Really, a punter with with everything that South Carolina football has been, you you went straight to field goal kicker and punter. That's shocking to me. And Georgia lost to us on a missed kick. Yep, you can give Parker Reddit, Parker White some credit there in that ridiculous uh, upset several years ago. Those are the three that I can remember. You got you got other examples for me, Scotty? Mm-hmm. Cell phone. That's what he gets. See, he called out my dad at Texas A&M. Cell phone goes out. He he goes field goal and punt, field goal kicker and punter. Mizzou 2018 did come down to a game winning field goal. To be fair, Mizzou 2018. I'm trying to remember that one on the monsoon game. Yeah, you're right. That was I, that's the Mar- Michael Scarnecchia game. Come on, Chris. That's not the monsoon game. That's the Scarnecchia game. Forever will be. And Parker White was a great kicker. Don't get me wrong. You're going to miss him for sure. It will be a step down. Whoever takes that job, whoever ends up winning that thing, what's Herrera or Mitch Jeter, neither one of them have much experience. 
I, I think it will be a step down, but to to go straight to special teams for most and least confident going into the Carolina 2022 season to me is a massive oversight of so many different, more important positions. That's just where I see it. So Scotty, I'm just, just trashing you while you weren't on there, just trashing your, your special teams pick. What about other positions, man? What, what about the interior defensive line, the offensive line, as far as concerns for Carolina going in 2022? Oh, he can't even hear me now. Good. I do feel better about talking about you while we, we can see you at least, Scotty. But you just oh, can't I, hear, I, us I, hear you, I hear you now. I hear you. I, I think I lost you. I think I lost you when I said I think your trajectory of last season changes tremendously if Parker White misses that field goal against East Carolina, don't you? Yes. East Carolina, Louisiana Tech several years prior, and then the Georgia upset. Parker White deserves a bunch of credit yep. for those wins. Uh, Missouri was brought up, the, the Michael Skarnecchia game. But other than that, what do you got? I mean, that he played for five years, right? And th- those were less than five games. That's all. All right, we're kicking Scotty Fair out of there. Fair enough. All assessment. right. No. <laughs> all right. We'll let you get back to the walk, man. It looks like the, uh, the connection, I think, has finally uh, gone out on us. Appreciate you joining us for as long as you did. Good. Where, where are you? You got the steps in? You got a, a mileage for us at this point? Are you uh, up to the third mile? I think I think I lost him. All right, there we go. Scotty Eisberg, ladies and gentlemen, is only he can do. Always on the move. The hot dog straw is the is the most disturbing part of that conversation for sure. Oh, it looks like Chris is in here. He says, do people remember how bad Parker White was his first year? I predicted he would lose his job going into twenty eighteen. Freezing cold take of the century. I don't think he was ever bad. I think Muschamp was horrible in his decision making. Hey, we got a chance to kick a 54 yard field goal. Yeah, let's put the kid out there who's never made a 50 plus yarder, who's clearly got the leg to do it, but his, we're crushing his confidence with putting him in that same situation time after time after time. And everyone in the entire stadium doesn't want you to do that, but yet you're going to keep doing that and you're going to keep getting the same result but, uh, because he made it in practice. And Muschamp's the ultimate preparation guy. It's all about practice. He can make him a practice. I don't know what the deal is. And I'm I'm more towards Chris's take on this than I am towards Scotty's. Fans should be excited about the Beamer Ball aspect of this football team. For a team like Carolina trying to overachieve, special teams is a facet of the game they can steal. Most well-coached unit in college football. Well, that one's a little, a little bit too far to me. That one... We'll see. It remains to be seen. You got to have, if Kai Kroger's back and healthy, then okay, your punching situation's in great hands. If you get one of those guys to step up as a solid, dependable, at least field goal kicker, then you can say most well coached unit in college football. It, it got Carolina's got a long way to go to get to be the most. I mean, that is an interesting phrasing there. The most well coached unit in college football. Okay. But you got to produce. To me, the most well-coached unit in college football is the is the special teams unit that makes the most plays. And Carolina has a, has a long way to go. If, if Shane Beamer didn't have that last name, I don't think anybody would be touting the special teams anywhere close to that. Yeah, and yeah, Beamer's talking today at 1.30. Got the call-in show on Thursday night. Football is back. Yeah, the week doing the basically the rough draft, the walk-through week for Carolina football is is how they're setting things up. For sure. And it, it's a smart way to do it, especially going into year number two for Shane Beamer and company. But uh, for fans, for, if nothing else, right? Why not? Why not get the routine going? Why not have the second week of doing a routine be your first pregame week? That makes a lot of sense to me. But it will be interesting to hear what Shane Beamer has to say today and then to hear what he's got to say a week from today. And how much, if anything, if any, that will change. I'm guessing we'll just get more Georgia State specifics, more Sean Elliott questions one week from today as opposed to today where we should get a review of the second scrimmage, right? And basically a review of preseason camp. And now it's flipping the page. It's getting into the season where you don't have a game this Saturday, but you're pretty much ramping up almost like you would. 
Fascinating. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier, what, we're down to 11 days, I think. You're just waking up with more energy, with an easier time to be feeling good about life right now. I know that's how I am as a college football fan. And again, we got it this weekend in a really small dose. And then we're going to get it next Thursday night with a backyard brawl headlining things, Pittsburgh and West Virginia. And I'm, I am pumped up about that one. Like to me, that is a great college football game because you got the regional aspect of it. You got two teams that really don't, that aren't nationally relevant by and large consistently for sure things to prove, right? A lot like South Carolina in a lot of ways, those programs. Love it. To me, that's that's what a Thursday night season opener should be. That's that's who deserves that stage. Steve Spurrier and, and the Gamecocks had it forever, seemingly. ESPN obviously loved it, ate it up, and I think Spurrier used it to his advantage for sure. Not quite in that space now with Shane Beamer and company. Spurs up show back in. Need to see a punt block, field goal block, return for a touchdown this season. Absolutely. Those things need to happen for Carolina to have a special season. And also, you need to go the other way, too. They, they don't need to happen to you. You need to be sound first, right? It, that was the, the Will Muschamp mentality way too much, in my opinion, was the punt return game. I'll never forget, they threw Hayden Hurst back there one game. And he... He didn't even cut touch a couple of punts because I think he had been told, unless you are 100% confident that you're going to catch this thing, absolutely, then don't touch it. And then it would roll 30 yards by. It hit, it bounced, and then would roll 30 yards. And it to me, in my head, that is how, if you ask me one scene to sum up the Will Muschamp era, it will be that. Too conservative, ball not bouncing your way, and you just watch helplessly as things are going against you from the Gamecock perspective. And then last year, I didn't see that very much. I mean, you're still, I'm sure Pete Limbo, the special teams coordinator is, is for sure telling his guys, you got to make these catches. Do you guys see what Florida state's doing at their, their camp? I think I retweeted this. I saw it on social media, their special teams guy. Maybe it was a GA. I got no idea, but they're in like all football practices ever. That's one of the things you do in kind of downtime, right? And warm up time, this solid 45 minutes that doesn't get counted as practice time where guys are on the practice field practicing. But a lot of that is uh, catching punts. Just it seems like a bit of a warm up or a looser period of time. But the Florida State guy had the, the super soaker out. Just shooting their guy right in the face as the punt's coming down. Loved it. Outside the box. Look at Craig Turbo taking one to the house this year. Already in on the Columbia transfer, Dante Miller. (laughs) Why would anybody say that Gamecock fans get unrealistic expectations in August? They'll never know. It'll be good to be able to concentrate on the action on the field instead of all this administration, administrative stuff with the conferences, Roger says. Oh, for sure. But you got to admit, what UCLA and Southern Cal did for college athletics, to me, just fast forward uh, forwarded our summer in a big way. And I guess the latest news yesterday, and I don't know how much stock to put into it, is that Oregon very much interested in joining the Big Ten as well, and it's reciprocated, and they're trying to work that out. We didn't see that coming. Nobody saw that coming this year. Nobody saw that coming this summer. UCLA, Southern Cal, 100 plus years of history. See ya. We're headed to the Midwest. We're we're gonna we now have a team in New Jersey in Rutgers in our conference in the next couple of years. See you guys. Crazy. And now what kind of ripple effects? Is it going to have? What about the SEC? Are they going to make another move? We all know about Oklahoma and Texas. Is it going to help move up that 2025 entry date to 2024 when it's going to happen in the Big Ten? 
to me, absolutely it is. But agreed. You can only talk about that for so long, Roger, with the, the hypotheticals and the what ifs, what kind of effect and the whole thing. Then we, we, we just need to start seeing plays, right? We need to start seeing games and we're getting so, so close. And that's why I'm waking up these days in more of a energetic mood, I think is the best way to put it. Now that football continues to get cranked up. Now that we saw the news yesterday, right? We got to the point where I, I think it was theater largely. You don't trade to get Baker Mayfield to have him as your backup quarterback to Sam Darnold. But now he's the Panthers starting quarterback. What kind of expectation do you guys have for Baker Mayfield as the Carolina Panthers quarterback? I think he's Teddy Bridgewater. I Actually, I think I, if I had to choose between Teddy Bridgewater and Baker Mayfield, I would choose Teddy Bridgewater. I think Teddy Bridgewater has proven more in his NFL career. I think he is just better. Turns it over less. I, I think Teddy Bridgewater is a better quarterback than Baker Mayfield. I think this will be the last starting quarterback that Matt Rule has with the Carolina Panthers. I don't think it's going to work out. I hope it does. I would I would love to see. I mean, Baker is great for football. He was great for college football. Planting a, a an Ohio State or planting an Oklahoma flag at Ohio State, the artificial turf that just bounces, it makes no sense at all. Uh getting to getting into a bit of a a scrum or making a pregame coin flip between Oklahoma and Kansas. Interesting. There are only so many guys that can do that, right? Not everybody can do that. Baker Mayfield's one of those guys. He's great for football. I hope he does well. I just don't see it happening. Oklahoma, Tennessee, Southern Cal and UCLA kick college football tradition in the gut. I hear you, Troy. Oklahoma, Texas, Southern Cal, and UCLA. Getting out of their old conferences, moving into the new ones. In a way, I'm with you. But also, do you do you blame them? I don't blame them. And did the schools deserve the blame? To, to me, this is an NCAA lack of leadership issue. It's been, there's been no leadership at the top in the NCAA for forever when it comes to college football, especially the COVID situation is the best example. Hey, you conferences, you guys figure it out. We're not going to do anything. When you need a strong leader the most in a time of crisis, if you ever have to show or have to have an example of leadership, that would have been it. And that clearly was it for me that, no, kick the can. Not, not for me. You guys figure it out. So if you're in charge of an athletics department and you can make a bunch more money for your athletics department, don't you deserve, don't you owe it to your school and programs to go do it? When you're a conference commissioner and you can get much more valuable organizations to join yours, don't, isn't that your job? That's what you're supposed to do. And ultimately, Troy, I, I hear what you're saying. But I, I think we're going to get some new traditions out of this, man. We're, we're going to get more good college football games on our television. And there, there are going to be some bad ones out there. I'm not trying to convince you that UCLA Rutgers is going to be must-see TV. But in the end, I think college football continues to evolve for sure. Some things you're going to miss out on. But let's not pretend like this has been the start of kicking college football tradition in the gut. I mean, even South Carolina joining the SEC, if you're a true traditionalist, that's an ACC school, right? The fact that Texas A&M hopped in the SEC in 2012 and they still, Georgia still hasn't been to College Station 10 years later. That's weird. I mean, that's not a tradition thing, but that, if, if you want to go back to schools kicking tradition in the gut, I'm sure 
Texas fans would say, hey, Texas A&M did it first, right? Yeah, when will the Big Ten change the name of the conference? And when does Power Five not become a thing? Clearly, we're not in a Power Five world anymore, or we won't be. I guess maybe when these schools officially move out of the conferences. It is a Power Two now. And then it's kind of the ACC as a third. And then I don't know what we have after that. Big 12, Pac-10-ish, whatever's going on there. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Speaking of that, I did want to bring up another football note. The coach of Friday Night Lights, Gary Gaines, passed away, age of 73. Played by Billy Bob Thornton in the movie. And then I forget the dude's name who played him on the TV show, but everybody seems to love him. I never watched the TV show much. Read the book back in the day and that was right. That was the the one kind of job requirement in the year 2000 when I moved out to Abilene, Texas. Guy who hired me, John Wilson, who's been on this show, said, you, you, you want to read this. And then read it. Fascinating book. It was before the movie came out, well before the show came out. But the book had already taken off. And then I go to weekly press conferences much like Shane Beamer is going to have today. Well, out in Abilene, Texas, it was the Abilene School District who held the weekly luncheons so you could talk to the Abilene High coach and the Abilene Cooper High School football coach, the two big coaches in the school district. And the school district's athletic director at the time was Gary Gaines. And then he, the next year, became the, the head coach of Abilene Christian University there, Division II football coach. So go go to those luncheons too, sitting beside the guy who coached the most famous high school team of all time. I mean, has been immortalized now in film and TV. And what I took away from Gary Gaines, just kindness, just kind. You can treat people right. Absolutely. In, In whatever position you're in in life. It's just a guy who treated people well and happened to be in a really interesting place at a really interesting time where a writer came in and then changed things completely in so many ways. But Gary Gaines was just, he was a football coach, man. And he always treated me well. And I, I think, I, I, I don't know, I think he is like kind of the protagonist of the TV show anyway, right? One of the, what, what's the line there? Something about the heart from the, the, the Friday Night Lights show. I know that's a big one. And if you guys are in there and you're yelling at me right now, sorry if you're really big into that show. But I, I thought it was kind of one of the, the heroes of the show, maybe. I don't know. But always a, uh, a really good guy to meet. Certainly rest in peace to Gary Gaines, the, the coach of Friday Night Lights, Odessa Permian back in the day. Oh, wow. You can hear the, the trash truck outside, Chris. Nice ears. Impressive. I didn't think the, the mic would pick that one up. It's all the way outside the garage. The garage is closed. Oh, we're cycling, just so you know. If you want to get the schedule going at my house, you can hear the truck's brakes. Yeah, they're out there. Chris is in the show big time today. Maybe it's because we are taking it down a notch uh, to try to pay respect to to Gary Gaines there during the middle of a show that's included fair share of Gamecock football talk. I think a, a lot of talk today because of the public comments yesterday from Monty Lee about his return to the Gamecock baseball program. Fascinating, for sure. Man, you, you couldn't draw this up a lot like what we've talked about with Spencer Rattler and the Gamecocks. Things change so much in a year, don't they? So much. If you would have said this time last year that in a year's time, Spencer Rattler, Monty Lee, and G.G. Jackson will be Gamecocks. All three of those. Crazy. Completely crazy. 
Oh, Roger was in on that noise as well. My apologies. See if I can uh, try to avoid that in the future. Definitely glad we haven't done the pull the car out in the garage trick too often here during the show. So the fact that Monty Lee was talking yesterday, he said everything that you need to say in his position for sure, right? Not thinking about the rivalry, really um, respects and cares about all his former players, whatever uniform they wear, not going to change the way he feels about them. Taking the job at Carolina was a no-brainer because of the history, the tradition, uh, the great experiences that he has had in the program prior and the respects he, ha he has for Mark Kingston. His job will be, and this is one of my favorite sayings now, dominate, dominating his role. Dominate your role. And I could just tell it's one of those things that maybe it's from years and years of listening to coaches talk publicly. It's one of those things that you can tell when they've said something, when they move from coach speak to public at large to public messaging, when they move from that type of speak to what they actually tell their team, to me, I can hear it, it their voice, but it changes. It, it clearly becomes more relaxed because they've been actually saying that message a bunch. And it's one that, that they've done a bunch of times. And that's what I heard from Monty yesterday about dominating your role. You just hear him telling players that, right? It makes a lot of sense. Hey man, you didn't, you're not in the starting lineup every day. Well, you got to dominate your role as a, a late pinch runner, pinch hitter for us. You're a, you're a bullpen, bullpen guy. You're disappointed. You didn't crack the weekend rotation. Well, guess what? You got to dominate that role for us in order to win games. And the only way you're going to end up getting back in the rotation is dominating your role now. Oh, Chris can even say you can hear the Coke machine start up. Sometimes as well. Nice work, Chris. You guys are really in here. Thanks for the uh, the notice. I'm again impressed with this uh, this microphone today. Glad it's coming through nice and crystal clear. But this is my big takeaway from the the Monty Lee Mark Kingston situation. Now is that what is Monty Lee's role? Because Ray Tanner did make a switch, right? But it was one major switch in his entire Carolina career that spanned almost 20 years, 15 for sure, right? I think it's probably, was it 96 through 2003? So I think it was 18 seasons to be exact, 2013, sorry. Which isn't right at all, right? 2012 was the last season, so maybe it was 17 seasons. Math is hard doing it publicly, especially now that I'm a little freaked out that you guys are hearing everything in my garage. But Ray Tanner came to Carolina a lot like most coaches come to programs with their right-hand man. And Mark Kingston's right-hand man actually got his former job. So Jim Toman came with Carolina from NC State to South Carolina and was there for a long time. We heard, what were you hearing? As I listened to, I was, oh, Monty Lee yesterday was talking about how he learned a bunch from Jim Toman. And that was, he was the recruiting coordinator back in the day, but how he involved all the coaches. So Toman is out and Chad Holbrook is in from one really respected assistant coach who parlayed that into a head coaching job to another really highly respected assistant coach and recruiter moving from the ACC at North Carolina to the SEC at South Carolina and clearly helping the operation and the national championships came from that and the whole deal. That was one change. But now we've seen several changes in Mark Kingston's coaching staff of just the right-hand man. This is at least the third one, the top assistant. And to not have a prior relationship with that one, where the prior relationship, this is where I was kind of going with, with Scotty, and he, he just wasn't seeming to think it's a, an issue at all. The prior relationship with Monty Lee is with the University of South Carolina program, which is Ray Tanner. And that's Mark Kingston's boss now. And that, to me, seems to be an odd dynamic where, and again, this is just me from the outside looking at it. Omani said all the right things yesterday, said that Mark Kingston is the one he's been talking with. He hadn't really been talking to Ray Tanner. Ray's busy running the athletics department and the whole thing. I get that from the outside. 
but how will how will that relationship that has to be a very a close one to begin with but one where you're on the same page where you know baseball is so individualized if you're in you get so much individual instructions in a batting cage for instance hitters Monty Lee is going to be with hitters specifically is that message that he's sending going to be exactly what Mark Kingston is then reinforcing or is that going to be the message that Kingston wants to enforce to to exchange to to get there and then when things go wrong inevitably like they will well then how do these these two coaches that have a, a bunch of experience how do they rally the team how do and I agree with what Scotty said. Monty Lee doesn't strike me as an ego guy who will not fall in line and certainly do what he's told. I, I, I think he absolutely will do that. But there is a big difference between relaying the, the top guy's message as an assistant coach and believing it. And, and that's where I think this, this thing gets really interesting. Roger says, Monty may improve the chemistry of this team, maybe in an intangible way. I don't know. Nothing but positive having him, though. And again, this is where fit matters. The role matters. I, I don't know. From the outside looking in, absolutely. And this is why like grading hires is so dumb. Matt Rule, great hire for the Carolina Panthers. Giving him a stability and a contract and confidence in the whole deal. It hadn't turned out to be a great hire. Lamont Paris. Oh, what are those guys doing? Who is that guy? That's not a good college basketball hire. Shane Beamer? He's never even coached before. That's not a good hire. It's an easy, easy national perspective, right? The Will, the Will Muschamp thing was seen that way nationally when a lot of local perspective was trying to say, wait, wait a second, look at the fit, the whole thing, the recruiting, this actually can work. Bill Belichick didn't work out in his first job. Well, no, 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 that actually turned out to be correct. So I, I just always take pause when anyone is hired. It's a lot like recruiting, right? We will not know whether it's a good hire or a bad hire until an extended period of time has gone by a lot like recruiting outside of some tremendous names, right? Jadavian Clowney was a, was a big win in recruiting outside of that. What Josh Belk was supposed to be a, a big time player at Clemson transfers over to Carolina, never gets on the field. He was a highly touted prospect four star kind of guy. Maybe on the on the cusp of the five star back in the day. I, I don't think maybe that high, but someone who never played any kind of meaningful snaps in college football, and that happens a lot. So it will be the, the, the devil's in the detail kind of thing, and the timing is awfully interesting for both Monty Lee and Mark Kingston and Ray Tanner, for that matter, where they all are in their careers. It seems like to me an odd an odd triangle right now to to make sure everyone's on the same page and get things moving in the right direction because it is so massively important to be highly successful in the 2023 baseball season. Chris says, I hope it, I think it comes down to who, who initiated the hire, Tanner or Kingston. It matters because I see it as if Tanner did, then does Kingston start looking over his shoulder, thinking that he's hired his replacement down the road? Yeah, and that's something that we'll never get the full story on, at least not anytime soon. It's one of those why I really like watching these documentaries like The Captain, where Derek Jeter finally felt the freedom to give his actual thoughts because they, they wouldn't have any kind of real-world implications anymore. They didn't have any real-world impl implications, so he could say, yeah, when people ask me, it's so dumb when people would ask me, like, what happened on that error? What, do you think I wouldn't try to catch it? 
or what happened on that strikeout? Why, why, why are you struggling at the plate? Well, you think I'm not trying? But he didn't answer it like that at the time, but he wanted to. Part of the media game, right? Well, the last thing that Monty was going to say yesterday is that, oh, yeah, Ray called me, and we started talking, and then it happened. We were going to get that. I'm not telling you that's how it happened, but I'm certainly not telling you that I 100% believe every word of how it was relayed to us, how it was happened yesterday. I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm going to need to see those two guys working together and speaking to us together to get a sense of how they work together. You, you guys remember the co-defensive coordinators? Remember that situation in 2014 for Carolina? Football, Steve Spurrier. That was 2014, right? Or was that 15? Help me out. No, that was 15. My fault. Lorenzo Ward got to run the show in 14, right? Carolina's going to have a better defense. So Spurrier made it halfway through 15 with co-defensive coordinators. Clearly, Lorenzo Ward got fired, but they didn't boot him out the whole way, good recruiter, especially the Atlanta area, had had a track record. So you don't want to completely kick him out, but I don't even remember the guy's name off the top of my head. You guys remember? Help me out. It was all Brady Hoke's brother, right? What was his first name? Oh, man, coming in from the Bears as an assistant coach. And that press conference where all three of those dudes were sitting at a table in williams Bryce Stadium was clearly uncomfortable. The role, right? The role. Dominate your role. Well, I don't think those, if, if those roles were clearly defined, it was clear, John Hoke, thank you, Craig, that they weren't comfortable in those roles. So that's what it comes down to now, in my opinion, with Monty Lee and Carolina baseball. Can Monty be comfortable being an assistant coach? I think absolutely. Not an ego guy. And I don't, Mark Kingston's not an ego guy either from I have to get all the credit and this has to be my team and my program and the whole thing. At least he doesn't come across that way publicly. I'm not trying to tell you that it's been all sunshines, lollipop, sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows in his tenure. Certainly there have been issues. Mainly... I, Internally only, I'm talking about. As there are in every college uh, sport across the board, every college team. But getting a guy with Monty's reputation coming from Clemson, it's weird to me that coming from Clemson, coming to Carolina is kind of down on the, the totem pole of list uh, on the list of things that are going to be worked through in this situation. Crazy to me. But will be tremendously interesting. And remember, dominate your role today. I'll take a steal that right from Monty yesterday. It's a great one, man. So you got find some joy from Beamer and dominate your role now from Monty Lee and Carolina Baseball. I will only see baseball players from a position standpoint now as buffalo or deer. You're either a big buffalo or you can run like a deer. You guys, if you haven't been paying attention to Jordan Montgomery, you probably have to now. Headlining things with his first complete game last night, a shutout for the St. Louis Cardinals. First guy since Fernando Valenzuela in 1981 with his first four starts on a big league team, giving up one earned run. Impressive stuff. Braves looking good last night. Well, if you beat the Pirates 2-1, to one, no offense, Anthony. That's not necessarily impressive. Good enough to get a win last night. Now just three games back with the Subway Series going the Yankees' way. Aaron Judge hit 47. His 47th home run yesterday, my kids were telling me. Is it Schwar Kyle Schwarber is second in the majors with 34, I think. But what really came out of that game was the hot dog straw. Someone has taken American culture to another level. 
I showed the video. John Boy had it up. Hollowing out with a straw, a small sliver in a hot dog to make it a de facto straw in the beer, sucking it through the hot dog. My world changed yesterday because of that. Have a great Tuesday, everybody, Roger says, and agreed. Y'all take care. Great show today, Anthony says. Hopefully, we'll put at least one game. We'll get it, pull out at least one game in the series against the Braves. Hopefully not, Anthony. Atlanta doesn't need that right now. John Hoke didn't think he was going to be coming up at the end of today's show, but I never thought we'd be talking about a hot dog straw either. One of the reasons why I love doing it every day with you guys. Live streaming 8 to 10 every morning. Please comment, like, and subscribe. Do all of that stuff on the social media to to help support the program. It is greatly appreciated. And we'll do it again tomorrow. August 23rd edition, Tim Hill Unrestricted Free Agent in the books.